Well, welcome everyone to the uh, beginning of the 61st session of the Menno Simons Lectures here at Bethel College. I'm John Thiessen, archivist and co-director of libraries here and current chair of the committee that puts together this lecture series. The Menno Simons Lectureship began in 1953 with Roland Bainton as lecturer and now the, the series is almost half as old as the college itself. It's funded by an endowment provided by the Kaufman and Yankee families, as you can read in more detail in your printed brochure. This afternoon, we're meeting in a different location and time than has been the pattern over the last couple of years. That's to accommodate one of the other additional events of the busy schedule of the weekend. There's a wide variety of things going on in the area this weekend. Our speaker this year is Marlene Epp, Professor of History and Peace and Conflict Studies at Conrad Grable University College in Waterloo, Ontario. Her most recent publication is A 50-Year History of Conrad Grable, which just has come out very recently. And as a digression here, we might note the many Bethel Conrad Grable connections from J. Winfield Fretz, who was the founding president of Conrad Grable, and before and after that time period, uh, spent a number of years living in this community, uh, attending this congregation. And then the current president of Conrad Grable, Susan Schultz Huxman, is also someone who spent her youth and college years here in this, uh, on this campus and in this congregation. Now, some of you will have read some of Marlene Epps' other books, uh, most likely Mennonite Women in Canada, A History from 2008, or Women Without Men, Mennonite Refugees of the Second World War from uh, several years before that. And uh, those two books and a number of others are out on the book table in back there, which you might uh, want to take a look at. Now, the uh, overall title for the lectures the next couple of days is the semiotics of Swebach, <laughs> sauerkraut and spring rolls, Mennonites and foodways. Now maybe some of those words aren't familiar to you. I know I had to go and Google spring rolls, but nevertheless, you know, it all means something, uh, just in case you wondered. And sauerkraut or spring rolls would be a, it would have been kind of messy to eat up here. The title this afternoon, specifically, which I am acting out here, is "Eating Like a Mennonite: Food and Identity." Thank you, Marlene, for being here to engage us in this discussion of food and identity. And if you want one, I left one up here for you. <laughs> Thank you, John. I'll save this feedback for later. Maybe cut my lecture short in order to get to that quicker. Well, good afternoon and greetings to you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and welcoming me and hosting me so well already here in um, Newton in the Kansas Mennonite community at Bethel College. Um, I bring greetings from the youngest Mennonite college in North America. We celebrated our 50th anniversary a few weeks ago at Conrad Grable to, I think, what is the oldest Mennonite college in North America. And uh, as John already indicated, I bring greetings in particular from um, our president, Susan Schulz Huxman, who um, knows many of you and would probably greet you all. So consider yourself greeted by, by Susan. I'll say just a little bit about my Bethel connections. I do have some connections to Bethel beyond this visit. My parents, Frank and Helen Epp, were students here at Bethel College for one or two years in the mid-1950s. They lived in a train car, a Pullman train car that was located on the college campus and that served as housing for married students on campus. 
My mother tells me it was called the Pullman Court after the Pullman train cars that they lived in. That's the train car on the top slide. Uh, the car, she tells me, was yellow and green. Um, my parents are on the bottom right slide with my two older sisters. My father graduated from Bethel College in 1956. And just before I came here, I asked my mom, Mom, was I conceived at Bethel College? <laughs> I thought that would make a really good story. She said no, so I'm sorry I was not. <laughs> the other picture that she managed to find was the one on the left of her uh, baking. And those appear to be Einbach, not Zwiebach. But um, I found it interesting that she, this one few pictures that she had of this experience, one of her was of her in the kitchen. She wasn't one who loved cooking a lot. So I wonder what this picture was all about. Was it maybe to show that you can bake buns in a train car? Or was it she was so proud of herself as a newly married uh, young Mennonite wife that she could bake buns and she was proudly showing her young husband that yes she was a good good cat she could make good Mennonite buns uh, so I was thrilled to find these pictures that connect me a little bit to Bethel um, this is an absolutely stunning painting by a Canadian artist named Rhonda Harder Epp no acquaintance to me uh, sh and I'll just leave you with this image to look at while I go through some of my other slides and begin my talk. Um, this was part of an exhibit that I hosted at Conrad Grable two years ago on just food, uh, food justice. And I'm going to talk more about that at the convocation talk at the college to the students tomorrow. So what does it mean to eat like a Mennonite? In January, uh, oh, and I'm just going to say I'm fighting a cold, so if I take lots of gulps of water, please uh, bear with me. In January of this year, the New York Times ran an article titled, Eat Like a Mennonite, which is where I got the title of my talk today. A very intriguing title that no doubt invited readers to ponder exactly how do Mennonites eat. I picked up the article eagerly. In fact, the article said very little about Mennonites at all, about their eating practices or Mennonites and food generally. The writer was participating in an experiment relating food to levels of BPA or bisphenol A, the chemical found in many plastics. She referenced a study that found levels of BPA in old order Mennonite women that were a quarter that of the national norm. And she attributed this to the fact that they eat more fresh food, make their own dairy products, and purchase fewer consumer goods. This is possibly true, I don't know. As the writer herself went through a prescribed regimen of detoxification from BPAs, her levels went down, but as she said, I was never able to out-Mennonite the Mennonites. Well, while the subject matter of this article was really not about Mennonites at all, it nevertheless was able to make a clear statement about Mennonite eating practices. They were somehow more healthy, more wholesome, this may be true for some Mennonite individuals, perhaps for some Mennonite groups, um, but I think it's mostly a generalization. The article reflects, I think, present day health and environmental concerns about what we put into our bodies, intentionally or not. One of the, these is the food that we eat, mostly by our own choices. Wide ranging food interests and concerns have turned many of us into foodies, people with a passion for eating, talking, and thinking about what we eat. Am I a foodie? Well, I like to eat good food. I like to read about, talk about, and write about food. But anyone who knows my husband Paul and has been to our home for dinner knows that he is the better cook by far, enjoys cooking more and has raised our two sons accordingly. My lectures here and current research is nurtured by a growing interest in food history in North America and around the world. 
Food offers an obvious, and perhaps too obvious, glimpse into the social history of family life, of daily life. At a very simple level, food consumes an enormous amount of historical time. It is really quite recent, probably the latter half of the 20th century, where the preparation, consumption, and preservation of food takes relatively little time in the average urban dweller's life. Our distance from the source and our quest for convenience would suggest a certain taken-for-grantedness about the food we eat and its centrality to human existence beyond just as fuel for the body. In contrast, and as historians of the frontier note, pioneer rural settlement demanded an intimacy and familiarity with food that is by and large foreign to 21st century urbanites like myself. Although like many city dwellers, and like the people I had lunch with today, my husband and I have nurtured a chaotic vegetable patch in our front yard again this year. Enjoying at least a few weeks of our own raspberries, tomatoes, eggplant, beans, and peppers in roughly that order. This is a picture of Paul beside the one of about a dozen sunflowers he planted that survived survived the squirrels and the rabbits. He was tremendously proud of this. Well, if history is about uh, how people live their lives in time and space, then food and food ways surely must take a front seat in historical inquiry. But I hardly need to justify talking about food to a college community that chose to reflect on its hundred years through the lens of food. As I was writing the text, as John showed you, to mark Conrad Grable's 50th birthday, I came upon The Thresher Table, Bethel College's book of food stories, recipes, and historical reflections. This proved to be an inspiration to our own history book, which has recipes also for our signature food, the giant chocolate chip cookie, known across the entire University of Waterloo campus. Recipes for this cookie found its place alongside presidential quotes. Well, I dare say that Bethel College's historians were well ahead of their time in imagining that, that one could understand history through the lens of food, and that recipes functioned as stories as much as they offer culinary instruction. And I'll talk about that in my third lecture. Indeed, I understand that the threshing motif pervades, pervades this college, as I've already seen from its sports teams to its mascot to its academic awards. And with Kansas Mennonite identity so closely tied to the hearty red turkey wheat, I know I am preaching to the converted, a room full of foodies, perhaps. Well, historians and others are increasingly asking questions about what people ate and when, to inquire about the role of food in encounters between people, natives and newcomers, immigrants and residents, about how food shapes national and regional identities, about the usage of food in public policy, and about the relationship between food and social class, food and sexuality, food and memory, for instance. And some of this inquiry is evident in a recent collection of essays that I co-edited titled Edible Histories, Cultural Politics Towards a Canadian Food History, where we made use of that painting that you saw. In addition to the question that concerns culinary historians, the what and the how and the when, an array of food studies scholars are deciphering the meaning that can be gleaned from foodstuffs, the things that we eat, and food ways, the attendant practices and customs. When we eat certain foods at specific times and for particular reasons, we know that food is imbued with meaning, cultural, religious, social, and political meaning. Hence the overall title for this series, The Semiotics of Svibach, Sauerkraut, and Spring Rolls. The way in which food and eating function symbolically in communication and experience is at the core of semiotics, the philosophical study of signs and symbols. As one scholar has noted, food is endowed with complex values and elaborate ideologies, religious beliefs, and prestige systems. And while food is an immediate and material reality, 
Needed for sustenance and pleasure, it also communicates meaning and represents signification. It is both itself and more than itself. In fact, food is so ubiquitous and so everyday that we almost overlook its potential to offer meaning in and of itself as a point of departure for historical analysis. This interest in the history of food and eating and the meanings attached to this is of course also stimulated by contemporary concern over such issues as food security and sustainability, tainted food and food-related illness, local and slow food, food prices, and persistent global hunger. While I won't explore these issues directly, they are all ingredients in the same stew, if you will. Indeed, one might ask if Mennonites have anything unique to say about the food issues, some call it a food crisis of our day. Of course, some Mennonites, well, actually one Mennonite woman, in fact, was well ahead of her time when in 1976 she proposed a more with less response to the food crisis of that era. Doris Jansen Longacre's call to eat less meat and more grain so that less global food energy would go towards feeding the rich at the expense of the poor predated Michael Pollan's omnivore's dilemma call to eat food not too much, mostly plants, by three decades. That more with less practice and philosophy caused a food revolution and as we've heard in the Mothering Mennonite Project, a food rebellion in countless households across North America and beyond. While demonstrating our contemporary concerns about what goes into our bodies, the New York Times article also reinforces stereotypical linkages between Mennonites and food. What is it about Mennonite identity both as insider perception sorry, as outsider perception and self-identity that suggests some unique relationship with food that results in popular signage for Mennonite sausages, Mennonite eggs, Mennonite produce, especially in communities with a large population of conservative Mennonites. And this is very true in Waterloo Region where I live. In fact, this semester I'm teaching a new first year course called simply, Who are the Mennonites? And in the first week of class, we just played a word association game. Many students in the class did not know much about Mennonites. I said, you know, give me a word that comes to mind when I say Mennonite. And I was writing these on the board. And I heard one student say pious. And so I wrote down pious. And he says, no professor, I meant pies. So I changed that to pies. His particular association was Mennonites and pies. Well, popular perceptions linked romanticized close to the land life of the old order Mennonites and Amish with assumptions about food practices, that they are somehow more wholesome, healthy, organic vegetables imbued with piety, perhaps. Some of these perceptions may be partly true, but there is also much generalization. In fact, in my community, many old order Mennonite food producers and gardeners have in fact turned their own growing practices towards more sustainable models in order to respond to the market for such foodstuffs among organic eating locavores in the city, rather than the other way around. The linkages between Mennonites and food, of course, as you know, are reinforced by such events as the annual Mennonite Central Committee relief sale, where our ability to make scrumptious food is contested only by our ability to make beautiful quilts. In this context, we feed the world by feeding, sometimes overfeeding ourselves. Since you've been talking about sex much of this weekend here in Kansas, I'll give you one more random untested thought about the linkages between Mennonites and food. In their ability, inability to talk about or deal with sex or downright rejection of it, did they channel their libido into food? <laughs> Unlike Gandhi, who became ascetic in both food and sex, this seems like a topic for Mennonite creative writers, and I'd probably best leave it to them. 
<clears throat> but there may be something to the idea that especially in eras when sinful was a descriptor attached to most forms of extravagance, the kitchen was somehow accepted. In fact, in the Centennial Treasury of Recipes, published here in Kansas, the foreword says this, quote, it was a sin to be lavish in clothing, in home furnishings, in entertainment, and in other areas. But the Swiss Mennonites felt that money and energy spent on food was a necessity. Another example of Mennonite styles of eating. In the wonderful two-volume Mennonite Foods and Folkways from South Russia by Norma Jost Voth, there's a recipe story for eating watermelon Mennonite style. Most people chuckle incredulously when I refer to this. That Mennonites might have a unique and particular way of eating watermelon is intriguing to outsiders. Having married, however, into a Mennonite family in British Columbia that has an obsessive passion for watermelon, I now realize that my family was not really Mennonite at all. <laughs> Since we cut our watermelon into polite round slices, which were then quartered so not too much watermelon juice dripped from our faces, the practice on the right of the picture. Rather than having the watermelon and slicing it into large wedges, which is the Mennonite way to do it, <laughs> apparently. The latter method was clearly more Anabaptist and egalitarian, <laughs> since according to Mennonite foods and folkways, it gave everyone a taste of the little Abraham, the sweetest center of the fruit. You should see my in-laws fight over the little Abraham. <clears throat> For some Mennonites, watermelon is at the center of family and community stories and reinforces collective memories of particular places and spaces. If the food, ways and food and Folkways book is right, it is part of our identity. Well, food is part of identity in many ways, including the emotional and psychological identity of all of us as individuals. But today I'll talk about the religious, ethnic, and gender identity of food. First of all, food is part of religious identity. Each year I teach a course at Conrad Grable called Food, Culture, and History. One of the most interesting guests I have is a friend and colleague named Michel Desjardins, who has spent many years traveling the globe exploring the food traditions in the world religions. He tells fascinating uh, stories, and even more important, shows many delectable photographs. This one of this Jewish Seder meal that commemorates the Jews' exodus from Egypt. Um, the, uh, each food on the plate signifies a particular symbol um, of the, the Jewish exodus. He talks about the extreme food avoidance, which is part of the nonviolent belief of the Jains in India, of the kosher and halal dietary practices within Judaism and Islam, respectively, of the Muslim fasting period of Ramadan that ends with a feast called Eid, of food offerings to ancestral spirits in Buddhism, and many more. And in many of these contexts, women hold a place of authority as they preside over the food practices within their religious traditions. The Christian students in the class often remark on how few food-related rituals there are in their, in their traditions. Yes, we do have the Lord's Supper, the communion meal, celebrated twice, maybe more, in the church year. In some churches, potluck meals are akin to religious observance. Food charity is important as well. While we may eat pancakes with abandon on Fat Tuesday or Shrove Tuesday, most of us do not follow this with abstinence from oil or eggs or other rich foods for the Lenten season, which kind of defeats the purpose. Yet I think in our human yearning to imbue our spiritual expression with everyday practices and vice versa, to sanctify our daily tasks, we have managed to connect certain moments in the church year 
in the Christian year with our cultural food ways. In the absence of ritual food customs that are part of practicing the faith, we instead develop systems of food by association. That is, Mennonites create their own unofficial rituals that satisfy the need to position food in religious practice. We eat certain foods to accompany particular religious festivals, pepper nuts at Christmas, Pascha at Easter, Porzulcha at New Year's. The new sensory historians would no doubt make much of the cookbook comment that, quote, the fragrance of the kitchen was probably enough to kindle the Christmas spirit. The celebration of Christ's resurrection is honored both materially and symbolically as we eat the risen Pascha, baked in coffee tins so it will rise tall and reach the heavens and sometimes spill over. The inevitable comparison of who in the congregation makes the best Pascha for Easter breakfast may seem to desacralize a pivotal event in the Christian year, but it indirectly, I think, honors the role of women in bringing meaning to the moment, at least in the past when women did not have roles in public worship, but whose culinary roles were foundational to the semiotics of the season. Now, of course, men have entered the Pascha competition. One can now call it a Pascha battle. The centrality of specialty foods marking moments in the Christian year may have been more pronounced in the past when Mennonite church life itself was at the center of Mennonite communities. Indeed, I understand that in the early settlement years, the Swiss Valhinians in Kansas were called holiday people by their English neighbors because they always seemed to be visiting and feasting. Food also holds great meaning in religious ceremonies, such as weddings and funerals. My mother-in-law considered a wedding meal without two meats and several desserts hardly a wedding at all. <clears throat> When we attended a wedding reception in their community, which was a stand-up affair with only raw vegetables, tiny sandwiches, and squares, she declared the couple not married at all. <laughs> well, this also points to the, to the dysfunctionality of food abundance in Mennonite identity as well. So that when planning our own wedding, I was less worried about my in-laws' reaction when they learned I was not taking their family surname than I was about the meal, what the meal would be. <clears throat> that watermelon eating might even function as ri religious ritual is suggested by a man named Hen <clears throat> excuse me, Henry King, who is quoted in Foods and Folkways to say, quote, Next, perhaps, to its unquestioning faith in baptism, the Mennonite heart hugs the watermelon above all things. Baptism, watermelon. <laughs> we might chuckle at this, but watermelon does indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, watermelon does indeed appear in Mennonite memory at moments of high religious meaning. Reflecting on her grandfather's death in Russia before the revolution, Helen Duick <coughs> wrote this in her memoir. On his deathbed, he said farewell to everyone, but then, but then asked, after saying farewell to everyone, asked if the watermelon that the herdsman had given him had tasted good since he had not been able to eat it. His idea of what constituted a good watermelon may well have summed up his entire life story as he prepared to leave earth for the next life, hoping, no doubt, that in heaven all the watermelon would be sweet and juicy. The same woman was among thousands of Mennonites who fled their homes in present-day Ukraine in the midst of the Second World War as German occupying troops retreated back to Germany. On the refugee journey came to be known as the Great Trek, Helene Duick recalls that they rested for several weeks in a Ukrainian village. Some of the trekkers went to visit the nearby Mennonite settlement of Zagradovka and were received with open arms. It was the season for watermelon, how we enjoyed the juicy fruit. It was a reminder of home. As I discovered in much of my research, 
for refugees who are wrenched abruptly and involuntarily from their homes, food holds much religious meaning, not only because certain foods, like watermelon, are symbolic of the homes left behind, but also because hunger is linked so closely to despair. In fact, it was because of my doctoral research on Mennonite refugees, mainly women, of the Second World War, that I became interested in the role of food and how people thought about and remembered their life stories. In the oral histories that I collected and in the written memoirs that I read, food often emerged at crisis moments in an individual's life. And as you might imagine, the quintessential Russian Mennonite food, svibak, figures prominently. This, in fact, is a picture of a plate of svibak that I was served um, in um, Siberia three years ago. It became the main staple of the immigrant and refugee family's journey, a diet while en route. In preparation for departure, first in the 19th century, and then in the 1920s, and then in the 1940s, Mennonite women baked thousands of svibak and roasted them for the journey. When roasted, uh, when roasted properly, thoroughly dried out, and cooled, they can last up to several months without turning rancid. In one example, Mary Conrad Epp recalled her mother's food preparations in anticipation of their, tr their trip from Siberia to Moscow and departure for Canada in 1929. She said, Day after day, I watched Mama bake svibak, many, many of those double-decker buns. Mama toasted them in a warm oven until they were dry, and I liked them crispy that way. But why did Mama want bags full to eat on the train, was Mama's hurried reply. Beyond their qualities as the perfect travel food, svibak are prominent in Mennonite refugee stories in which emotions are prominent of sad and lo sadness and loss leaving homes, saying goodbye to loved ones sent into exile, and preparing packages for those in prison. The life-giving potential of this modest breadstuff is epitomized in Tina Dick Weeb's description of her mother's death in exile in Siberia. The family was severely malnourished and suffering from scurvy when a package of food arrived from relatives. Quote, at last the sleigh came with a package, how much joy. But mother was hardly able to smile as father opened it. He soaked a roasted svibak and tried to feed her. But she only looked at it with big eyes as she sank down in her pillow. She whispered with her lips, I don't need it anymore. It was barely audible. No, no, you cannot die, father cried out in despair. Don't leave me alone with the children but mother never opened her eyes again. The faint hope that if nothing else could save her, then maybe the taste of svibak would bring her back to life, brings deep meaning to this modest little bun. But svibak was also about looking to the future, to the, to the extent that rituals permit the expression of sentiments which cannot always be put into words, and thus act as a unifying social force, the roasting and packing of sacks of svibak became a ritual of hope and movement forward. To state it simply and semiotically, as long as there was svibak, God existed. Because of its biblical significance, bread itself carries symbolic connotations for being life-giving. The central Christian symbol of the Eucharist, for Mennonites the communion meal, whereby Christ's body is received in the eating of the bread, reinforces the connection between bread and life. Thus, when those in need of food receive bread, it is more than just something to satisfy hungry stomachs or meet nutritional requirements. It carries the hope that there may, in fact, be survival and hope. Thus, numerous anecdotes and references to bread or svibak occur in stories that are more than just about giving bread, but also about giving life. Stories of food also emerge in accounts of miraculous moments when death from starvation seemed imminent. 
Agatha Schmidt remembers an incident from the time of severe famine in Ukraine in 1932 to 33. She said that our, ever, that our family ever survived through this is truly a miracle. One time I remember mother baked a flatbread which she divided into four equal parts. After we had each eaten our portion, she said, children, that was the last flour. We have no food left for tomorrow. Then she took us into the living room where we all knelt down while she prayed with us. That evening, a knock came at the door. Then the figure of a woman, thoroughly shrouded to conceal her identity, came in, set a freshly baked loaf on the table, and disappeared in the, into the darkness once more. We had no opportunity even to thank her, and to this day we have never discovered the identity of our benefactor who took risks to help us. Or when a young man hid in a haystack for over a week as Red Army soldiers arrived in his village and sent most of the Mennonite men into exile in Siberia. As told to me, a chicken would show up every day and lay an egg in the haystack and kept him alive. Or the woman and children in a westward refugee flight from an advancing Soviet army, having run out of their Svibak weeks before, arrive at a, an abandoned house to find a freshly cooked pot of potatoes abandoned on the stove. When I hear these and other incredulous food stories, I always wondered, were they true? And then realized that the facts mattered less than the idea that the memories of the end of hunger coincide with memories of being saved from capture. In this same study, I experienced fascinating linkages between food and Mennonite religious morals that occurred. Stealing food from farmers' fields or from employers' kitchens when your family was starving or a woman giving sex in exchange for food for her children, all these actions went against Christian beliefs about right and wrong and were among the kinds of activity condemned by Canadian Mennonite church leaders who called for a program of religious rehabilitation for the Mennonite refugees arriving in North and South America after the war. They caused a crisis of conscience for Mennonites who sought to preserve life in the midst of death that surrounded them. I think they made the right choices. So food is full of religious meaning. Secondly, food is closely tied to Mennonite ethnic identity. And of course, here we are really talking about cultural and familial ancestry. When we talk about Mennonite foods, we really mean Dutch or Ukrainian or Germanic or Swiss Volhynian or Pennsylvania German. We can also talk about Mennonite food as Mexican, Laotian, or Congolese. That's for tomorrow's lecture. The idea that there is such a thing as Mennonite food is evident in popular perceptions about Mennonites and is reinforced by Mennonites themselves in their cookbooks, their memoirs, their potlucks, and their kitchen tables. And Mennonites are not alone in this identification. Anthropologists often say that the surest way of discovering a family's ethnic origin is to look into the kitchen. Yes, Mennonites are foremost a religious group, but because of the way in which they have chosen to live historically, separated, sometimes isolated physically and psychologically, self-sufficient, their ethnic and religious practices have sometimes merged. The propensity of Mennonites to migrate for all kinds of reasons and in many directions have led some to describe their identity as transnational or diasporic. The idea and reality of diaspora for Mennonites may fit uh, the idea put forward by Bronwyn Walter's notion of a third space that is both and neither the original geographic homeland and the settled destination, but is a symbolic spatiality that exists outside of the binaries of home and away. For Mennonites, the diaspora is less about the Russian Empire in relation to North America, for instance, then it is about longing to return to or retain an ethno-religious identity thought of as home. Much of that longing for home is lodged in memories 
and practices of foodways that are perhaps the easiest to retain in a multicultural environment. A Mennonite meal also that I ate in uh, Siberia three years ago on a trip there. One of the main ways in which Russian Mennonites maintain their psychological and physical uh, connections to a homeland is through ethnotourism, whereby Mennonites continue to subscribe by the hundreds to annual heritage tours to sites of former Mennonite settlements in Ukraine, Russia, and Europe. Local tour guides cater to the nostalgia of return by serving Mennonite foods such as cabbage rolls and borscht to North American tourists. For the latter, main maintenance of food traditions was a way to recapture the golden age of their Russian Mennonite commonwealth. Eating Mennonite in places considered to be home reinforce and indeed create identity. For historically minded Mennonites, the common association of eating and nostalgia reveals the symbolic capacity of food to contain the past. Well, the title of these lectures, of course, refer to ethnic foods, svibak, sauerkraut, spring rolls, that are characteristic, at least in part, of some distinct Mennonite foods in the Dutch, Russian, Swiss, Pennsylvania, German, and yes, Laotian traditions. A year ago in the Canadian Mennonite, which is our national newspaper counterpart to the Mennonite, a leader in the church wrote an article titled, Mennonite Not Eaten Here. It was an appropriate call to privilege Anabaptist Mennonite religious identity above Mennonite cultural characteristics at a time when our churches are increasingly diverse in their ethnicity. In the regional conference of which I am a member, worship happens in 12 different languages. This is at once rich and complicated. The article suggested that we move away from telling our family stories, which include memories of foodways, in order to be more inclusive and welcoming. But stretching our imaginations when we think about Mennonite foods should not, I think, compel us to dismiss the overlapping connections between our religious identity, our ancestral histories, and our food practices. I personally fear the demise of a Mennonite ness that seeks to downplay or set aside the family history and personal ethnicity of any member since religion and culture cannot be separated. I think religion is embedded in culture. As a historian, I cringe at the notion of losing our family stories, which is where history is most fundamentally lodged and retained. I also know that many young people, the ones in my classes, are eager to learn about their roots, even if those roots are multiple, even if their own genealogy is an interesting amalgam of traditional, that is European, Mennonite ethnicity, and what we might call new Mennonite ethnicities. In fact, sharing one's identity with another might best happen over a meal, where taste buds usually overcome difference. Because we are able to think about food as everyday and without political meaning, although this isn't really true, we are able to integrate and maintain food as part of our identity, even while other features of Mennoniteness are less easy to maintain. Indeed, there's an adage about immigrants that while language is the first thing to disappear, food is often the last, or in fact, never disappears. Even though their distinctiveness as Swiss Volhynian, Low German, Dutch Russian, Prussian, and Polish ethnic origins in Kansas gradually diminished, the Mennonite, uh, the Mennonite Encyclopedia says the walls were torn down Perhaps in food ways, those differences were maintained more easily alongside uh, otherwise um, uh, merging. Today, some individuals who do not feel especially connected to church and religious life find their closest ties to their Mennonite identity through food. Canadian food writer and Mennonite Darcy Friesen-Hossack 
has proposed that a certain generation of Mennonites are embracing so-called ethnic foodways because so little else about being Mennonite is engaging them. After hearing her, I asked myself if that's why I chose to learn to make Svibach. Um, that was my first sabbatical goal. <laughs> I used YouTube to learn to make Svibach. My son said they weren't bad. I guess that's a compliment. Similarly, Alicia Duick, who recently published a thoughtful yet very complicated thesis on LGBTQ Mennonites, offered the idea that queer Mennonites who feel themselves outside of the normative categories of Mennonite identity with regard to sexuality, nevertheless can point to cultural aspects like food that help them maintain their self-identification as Mennonite. Some of this contemporary interest is manifest in numerous food blogs about Mennonite food. For instance, a woman named Katie blogs on the Shoe Fly Project and says this in her introduction. How I love that my family's story is a Mennonite one. Our food is our most tangible cultural artifact, our palatable heirlooms. Or the Kansas woman, whose name I just learned this, this morning, blogging about a year of Mennonite cooking, who describes herself as a Kansas woman who finds her grandmother's cookbook and begins a journey from the familiar to the strange recipes from her heritage. Some might bemoan the fact that an individual's food heritage is what connects him or her to a Mennonite identity. But I would say that if this is the only connection, it is not one we should lose. Those who disparage the cultural Mennonite are, I fear, limiting their imagination about what is included in a religious and spiritual framework. Well, historically, the task of preserving ethnic identity through food occurred in the kitchen, with women at the forefront of continuity, which brings me to the third aspect of food identity. A wonderful picture from the 1940s Kitchener market um, of a Mennonite woman selling eggs. One cannot talk about Mennonites and food without also talking about gender identity. <clears throat> Indeed, one could argue that at least historically, women construct their sense of self in the food they produce. Mennonite women have often been stereotyped by their associations with food, whether they are preparing it, eating it, or cleaning up after its preparation and consumption. The linkages are often seen in popular booklets about um, Mennonites written mainly for tourists, or in media reports about Mennonite relief sales, or in the cookbook publishing industry, which has thrived on the public's interest in Mennonite and Amish foodways. Here's one example. <clears throat> a popular 1954 booklet designed to educate the American public about Mennonite life. The author, well-known American Mennonite sociologist John Hostetler. He included a section titled Things Feminine, which says this about Mennonite women. I'm quoting. Not being afraid of hard work, they eat well. They cook, can, stock their whitewashed fruit cellars and provide well for their household. They probably pay less attention to their waistline than do most American women, and they find the needed creative satisfaction to free them from much worry." End of quote. Will images of contented, indeed jolly, robust Mennonite women whipping up huge batches of borscht, pie, and buns while singing merrily comes to mind. In this statement, women are praised as being culinary workhorses, yet obliquely critiqued for being overweight as a result of their fine cooking. And it continues. The 1959 article on Pennsylvania German culture in the Mennonite Encyclopedia, which is still on the um, Mennonite Encyclopedia online, uh, copied word for word, by the way, in the Bethel College published Mennonite Melting Pot of Mennonite Cookery, 
says this about kitchen culture. Housewives in Pennsylvania are little concerned with calories and vitamins, but ever alert to the virtues of cleanliness, taste, and the complete banishment of hunger from the domains over which they rule. They contributed to our national pantry such delicacies as cottage cheese, scrapple, various types of sausages, pretzels, coleslaw, and of course, sauerkraut. So here women disregard healthy eating in favor of good housekeeping and full stomachs. Another generalization, perhaps. Another widely circulated depiction that reinforces such stereotypes is within the food, food That Really Schmecks uh, series of cookbooks by Canadian cookbook icon from Waterloo Region, the late Edna Stabler, who was not herself Mennonite. Even while focusing on the food ways of the smaller, culturally conservative Swiss Mennonite groups, Stabler offered a broad portrayal of Mennonite women with descriptors such as plump, placid, and well-rounded. It's still in print. <laughs> Such adjectives, because located in a cookbook, had the effect of linking women's physicality and their personality with their food ways. Even though Stabler was surely talking about the old order Mennonite women with whom she had developed warm relationships over cooking, the depiction was easily transferable. As a Mennonite woman myself, um, not an especially good cook. I am, an, I am simultaneously amused and irritated by such stereotyping of my identity. The descriptors linking Mennonite women and food have ambiguous meaning. On the one hand, such characterizations gave women pride in their culinary abilities, which on occasion were publicly recognized as markers of who Mennonites are. On the other hand, stereotypes that exalted the intrinsic nature of women's activity in the kitchen minimized the drudgery of labor, of that labor, and also undermined their potential capacity in other sectors of community and public life. The gendered nature of food and its practices is very prominent in Mennonite community histories and in autobiography. For instance, in her memoir, Writer Katie Funk Weeb noted that in her understanding, growing up and becoming a Mennonite woman in essence meant learning to cook. Women took on homemaking as a destiny, and there was a general belief that women were by their very nature homemakers. For instance, in his 1942 Manual of Sex Education, yes, Mennonites have written manuals of sex education, Ontario Mennonite minister Clayton F. Durstein, who was from the United States, observed this. He said, women's bodies are formed to be homemakers, live indoors, and do the lighter tasks of life. Hence, they are not built so strong as men. Well, most homemakers, especially farm-based women and 19th century settlers, would hardly have considered their tasks light and knew that their biceps bulged from kneading endless batches of dough and stirring the cracklings and the miogropa, and that varicose veins resulted from too much time spent on their feet. The arduous labor of women on rural frontiers is documented in so many memoirs. Religious studies scholar Pamela Clausen stated it well when she observed because of the Mennonite romance with food, women's roles as the traditional makers of shoe fly pie, varenica, porzucha, svibak, and all the other relishes, breads, and sweets clustered on the table have been a source of power used by women and against them. There's a wonderful poem by Julia Kasdorf titled uh, Crazy in the Kitchen. I don't have time to read it now. If you want to hear it, I'll read it later. It essentially demonstrates that in the end, women's authority or in or confinement to the kitchen could both empower and oppress. As the primary purveyors of food and food-related customs in families and religious organizations, women carried special power to shape identity both internally held and external to Mennonite communities. While the female relationship to food is stereotypical, 
It is true that women played crucial roles with respect to the maintenance and or transformation of their community's foodways. Serving a meal to a large group of family and friends presented a Mennonite woman with an opportunity to present her skill at a task that was perhaps only second to childbearing in its place as an, an intrinsic aspect of being a Mennonite woman. While the Mennonites disdained many other forms of entertainment and cultural endeavor as being worldly, food production and consumption as an activity closely related to the land and necessary for sustenance did not come under scrutiny as something that could induce pridefulness or, or excess. We probably know, know better now. As such, women could receive much affirmation and encouragement in essence as culinary artists. Food could empower women when they loved it and imbued it with a sense of creativity and beauty as many cooks do. Eleanor Martins observed that her mother's artistry was evident in a household task as apparently mundane as food production. The way she lined up the fruit, apricots, cherries and plums, the jars stood there gleaming on the basement shelves, straight and sparkling in their newly preserved perfection, pleasing to the eye as well as to the palate. In fact, the Kansas-based Mennonite, uh, sorry, Centennial Recipe of Recipes, Centennial Treasury of Recipes, begins with the words of compiler Alice Kaufman's mother, who said, quote, cooking is an art and don't you forget it. Female self-worth was often tied to food preparation and presentation, whether it was the amount she could put away, preserve, at the end of harvest, or whether in the size and symmetry of her svibok, or how quickly her Veronica were snapped up at the community sale. As one community history plainly states it, the culinary reputation of every housewife on the threshing circuit was at stake each season. Furthermore, competition could easily develop between women as they judged amongst themselves and were judged by menfolk on such pivotal things as whose pie crust was flakiest and whose svibok were the shapeliest. My own mother-in-law, who had a grade three education, who could not uh, read or write very well, still held up her svibok as her creativity. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that must mean it's time to quit. Um, the linkage between Mennonite food, Mennonite women and food is reinforced in uh, memoirs of Mennonites written about their mothers. In rep reminiscing about their mother, the children of Susanna Kaler Weed all gave much space to their mother's culinary abilities, describing finally fondly the Russian Mennonite foods that she prepared for her husband and ten children, but also noting that she often cried while she cooked and was always the one to eat last and to take the smallest helping. Her son Henry recalled, quote, at mealtimes she was the last to sit down and constantly up again to bring things from stove to table, to put more gereishtet brot on the plate or potatoes or to refill our bowls with borscht or our coffee cups. Her daughter, Tina, echoed her brother. Mother serves everyone before she serves herself, before she herself sits down to eat her own small helping, half crying because she is thinking of the children who are no longer there and whom she misses very much. While the linkages here go unanalyzed, one can't help but wonder whether the rituals of feeding her family kept depression over her losses at bay. I think of my own grandmother, whose experiences of violence during the post-revolutionary years in Russia caused significant mental illness struggles. And while she was mostly vacant after shock treatments in the years that I knew her, nevertheless always pushed me to eat more in order that the sun would shine the next day. I in turn wondered, if I ate more, could I make her happy? 
Marie Ence would also recall that her mother was the last to eat at the end of a long day of constant food preparation for the team of men harvesting their crop in northern Saskatchewan in the 1940s. The day's menu included fried potatoes, bacon and eggs for breakfast, freshly baked cake with coffee for mid-morning break, roasted chicken with dressing, vegetables and potatoes, and homemade pudding for dinner at noon, cookies straight from the oven in mid-afternoon, for supper, fried ham, potatoes with cream gravy, canned corn and dill pickles, bread and buns, and blueberry pie baked that day. Whew. Of course, everything was homegrown and preserved. Quote, it was late when the men had eaten, later when we had eaten, and even later when mom had everything under control and could go to bed. This frenzy of harvest, work, and cooking would continue until the threshing was done. Edward Giesbrecht of Yarrow, British Columbia, similarly recalled the mammoth task his mother had in weekly baking for 11 people. On Saturday, she baked six pans of Svebach, 12 loaves of bread, butterhorns, cinnamon buns, and pies. Except for the bread, most of these are consumed by Sunday night. Often she bakes biscuits on Monday and pancakes on Tuesday to tide us over until Wednesday when she bakes another eight loaves of bread. Her baking requires over 200 pounds of flour every month. While some women were empowered by cooking, others experienced it as oppressive, especially if they didn't like to cook very much, but did it because it was their role. In her book, Baking as Biography, Diane Tai notes that her mother didn't really like baking and her fairly plain, unexotic, economical foods were indicative of a 1950s era when women who didn't especially like cooking could now whip up dishes rather quickly. While today we condemn convenience and processed foods, they were an important aspect of liberation from the kitchen for some homemakers of the 60s and 70s. Women who were unable or unwilling to cook Mennonite experienced challenges to their self-identity as women and as mothers. During difficult economic times in the years of early settlement on the Canadian prairies or American plains, or during the Depression, women were severely tested in the role of feeding their families according to Mennonite custom and expectation. For instance, during the Depression years, with six children to feed and clothe, Mary Newfelt offered meals consisting mainly of bread with lard or shortening with a sprinkling of sugar and for dessert, bread dunked in the juice of preserves. Women who arrived, uh, arrived as refugees from Ukraine after the Second World War, many of whom came to adulthood during years of food shortage and famine, felt inadequate as women and as mothers when their abilities to cook Mennonite were found wanting in Canada. During her refugee so sojourn during the Second World War, Helene Duick worked for a pastor in Germany. There she was taught how to wash lettuce and how to boil an egg. She recalled, Fortunately, I did not have to do much cooking because having grown up in Russia during Stalin's reign, I had not learned to cook since there was little available to cook with. Anyone could cook a thin potato soup with a few beans or carrots added. When some of these women arrived in Canada and worked as domestic health in wealthy homes, they frequently learned to cook English or cook kosher long before they learned to cook Mennonite. Of course, we have experienced a generational shift at the turn of the millennium, as men have entered and sometimes taken over the kitchen. While well, women, with much more effort, mind you, have entered the public realm of business, professions, and church. I consider myself fortunate that my sons have higher food expectations of my husband than of me. To a degree, we have crossed a foodways gender border, which brings me to tomorrow's lecture on eating across borders. 
1826, the French philosopher Anthelme Brillat Savarin wrote the phrase, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. His intention here was a simple reminder that the food one eats has a bearing on the state of one's mind and body. Over the time, the phrase has been modified as, you are what you eat, and implies a great deal about the significant relationship between food and identity. For Mennonites, religious, ethnic, and gender identity are all imbued with that linkage. But this is not a singular or static identity. Indeed, the Mennonite relationship with food evolves as they eat across borders. And that's the topic for tomorrow. Thank you. I got one last slide. So I guess we can take some questions. Is that right? Yeah. Let's take some time for questions and comments. Dale and Heidi have handheld microphones to carry around. If you could please explain spring rolls to us. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe you'd like to come to my lecture tomorrow, and then I'll explain spring rolls for you. Um, uh, in brief, uh, in, in my community in Waterloo Region, we have a significant presence of Mennonites from Laos in Southeast Asia who uh, came to Canada as refugees after the Vietnam War and the exodus of uh, refugees from Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos at that time, and there are a number of uh, Mennonite congregations in my area who have become very active in sort of the Mennonite food waste scene, but they uh, produce spring rolls as we know them in... Oh, sorry, what is a spring roll? Um, it is uh, usually a, a rice uh, paper uh, rolled up with um, meat and vegetables inside and then deep fried. So I think every culture has some deep fried dough with meat and or vegetables inside and this is this is that they're wonderful when i think of mennonite cooking I think of food preservation, canning and drying, and uh, making sauerkraut in in uh, big uh, jars, and uh, <clears throat> and um, chopping the heads off of chickens, and plucking the feathers from chickens, and on the, on the drying. Uh, in an upstairs room, having on the uh, uh, drying apples on the floor, and so on, uh, isn't that a dimension also of, of, of the culinary identity of Mennonites, the uh, the frugality and the preservation? Certainly, I, I would agree that Mennonites did a lot of that. I don't know if that was particular to Mennonites. I think uh, uh, people generally, you know, in an age before we had a lot, a lot of the kind of kitchen technology, um, uh, where you, with electricity, running water, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, we had food, uh, we had grocery stores, food transported from all the food we needed from long distances, and we have. Uh, um, processed foods and cans in grocery stores. I mean, before that era of the industrialization of food, essentially, um, all cultures preserved and put away food, um, I think. 
Um, in fact, there's some really interesting food manuals. I don't know if this exists in the U.S. I suspect it probably does, but in Canada in the early 20th century when the country was receiving significant waves of new immigrants from Europe, there are instruction, instructional manuals on how to cook Canadian, um, which include a lot of detailed instructions on preserving, uh, preserving foods. Uh, because if, if foods weren't as immediately accessible in, uh, on the ho in, in, the, in homesteading. Now, of course, now we're seeing a resurgence of food preservation um, that both men and women are, are undertaking. So there's a whole new era of food labor uh, involved in that. Is it something particular to Mennonites? Um, Mennonites have done a very good job of it, I think, because of our interest in thrift, frugality, simplicity, um, that has also, I think, rece received a boost with, with such um, projects like, um, you know, the more with less approach to eating and, and so on. Um, my mother-in-law, who um, I mentioned her a bit more this morning when I spoke, was, uh, as a refugee, had an uh, obsession with food, and she preserved mar far more than she needed. And I sometimes think of the, I don't know which biblical passage it is, but to just put away only what you need, and I sometimes think, aren't you overdoing it a bit? Um, she would, and she'd date them. I knew how, how much she put away because she would date them, of course, like you're supposed to do, and I always forget to do. Um, and she'd have years and years of uh, preserved goods in her, in her house. Um, her fear, because she had a fear of starvation, because she almost starved in, in the 1930s in uh, the Soviet Union. You mentioned the More With Less cookbook being ahead of its time, and yet, you know, 30 years on, or is it even closer to 40 years on, we have this phenomenon, Mennonite girls can cook, <laughs> which is almost like a throwback to the 50s in my mind, and yet the same families have both cookbooks. <laughs> so can you mention the, the kind of the conflicted nature of, of Mennonites and food? Well, certainly there are conflicted um, relation, relationships there. In, in my third lecture, I'm talking about just about cookbooks and talking about sort of their political meanings and uh, how they have changed over time. Um, you know, the More With Less cookbook is, uh, and its followers, the Simply In Season and um, uh, Extending the Table cookbook are uh, examples of a certain kind of cookbook that brings a political agenda uh, to our attention. Mennonite girls can cook, you know, is a really interesting phenomena because, of course, they're not girls. They're middle-aged women like me, and um, it, it's, it, I feel um, it, it serves to reinforce some of the stereotypes of that 1940s, 50s uh, literature that I talked about, and I hope they're being ironic. I can only hope that they're being ironic and that there's a Mennonite boys can cook, um, uh, addendum coming, uh, but at the same time, I also think they are. There, it's an interesting project by connecting their 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 religious faith to their their cooking and food ways, and I appreciate that aspect of it. I don't necessarily share sort of the the framework that that they hold, but I really appreciate the way in which they are connecting their love of cooking, their love of cooking. Uh, what we think of as traditional Mennonite foods uh, with all kinds of other recipes in their book, including gluten-free, you know, so that's another um, newer thing, with their, their own um, faith. Um, so linking food to our religious beliefs, which uh, I, I can appreciate that. Uh, I'd be happy for others' opinions of that particular project because it certainly is a phenomena. Yeah, I, I wonder... Yeah, that's fine. Sorry. Okay. I wonder whether <clears throat> you uh, put the emphasis that you have in your research in terms of Mennonite, Mennonites and cooking and Mennonite cookbooks. I mean, when I think of, is there such a thing for Methodists? I mean, what about, you know, do Presbyterians do this? Do we, uh, 
do, do. I'm not aware growing up in Germany with the dominant denominations being Catholic or Lutheran. Nobody talked about Lutheran cooking, Lutheran cookbooks, uh, the same for Catholics, and, and we only made regional, you know, distinctions in, in cooking uh, traditions. So I, to me, it would be nice to, you know, why is this so important, so especially important, seemingly, for Mennonites, and does, not, does that not link? I mean, I think you alluded to it, I think, in a way, to, to, the, to the migration history, to the diaspora. Where, where, where food then is linked especially with identity, which is both faith but also cultural. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be fun to, or, or important maybe to question, you know, to why do we not have, or do we have the same phenomenon in other religions? I'm aware of that in, in terms of Judaism and the Jewish uh, cooking, you know, which is linked to religion very mm -hmm. closely. Mm -hmm. But there's also the diaspora tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, I mean, you answered the, the question right there. I think uh, I've certainly uh, found this very true in the Jewish uh, tradition um, and have done some comparison with colleagues of mine who are researching Jewish cookbooks, and we compare Mennonite and Jewish cookbooks, and they're very similar. Uh, they function to in a nostalgic kind of way, sort of to re remember the past for diasporic peoples. So they serve this collective memory nourishment. They also serve a teaching um, role, maybe even more so in the Jewish tradition where, you know, food is so tied to uh, survival of religious rituals. And um, Jewish cookbooks that I know of very much serve to teach the next generation both the history um, um, but teach young women how to be good Jewish daughters. Yes, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've started to explore other, in Canada anyway, other immigrant cookbook groups. And um, someone, a Canadian historian, has does, done an amazing bibliography of cookbooks published, unfortunately, only up until 1950. And it's a thousand page book of cookbooks. Um, there's a lot of cookbooks of other sort of Christian and nominational groups, but they're like cookbooks published by women's institutes within, um, you know, like the local Lutheran women's. Um, association publishing a fundraising cookbook and so the foods aren't particularly Lutheran but if if it's a if it's a German Lutheran community they might be they might be German um, and I've started to explore this with some more newcomer groups um, Arab cooking for instance and um, but I think sort of the the propensity to keep publishing Mennonite and Amish cookbooks uh, relates in part to not so much that Mennonites need all these cookbooks, but there's um, a market demand for them from, you know, the world outside, if you want to call it that. People, I think there really is, a, and I talk to people who have all the time who have this perception that Mennonites sort of have a, they've somehow got it right in terms of, you know, eating more healthy, more nutritionally, more wholes wholesomely. And um, I'm not sure that's exactly true, but I think there's that perception that, that feeds the cookbook industry. Some years ago, I was thinking about food, and because I grew up here on a Kansas farm where there was never a shortage of food, and my mother um, had a massive garden, and she canned enough for 10 people, and then I was thinking about the Lord's Prayer. And I was going through it, and it says, give us this day our daily bread. And I thought, oh my God, how totally irrelevant. And then I thought, oh, but that was written 2,000 years ago. Oh, they didn't have a refrigerator, did they? They only had salt, dehydration, and fermentation as preservatives. And so it made sense for Jesus to say, or to tell his parishioners to pray 
give us this day our daily bread. And I don't know, would you, <laughs> would you like to comment on perhaps the Mennonite attitude toward f food as a gift from God? I'd like to think that we appreciate food as a gift from God. Um, this morning I talked about mindful eating, which I think includes that appreciation for the miracle that is food that we take so, so for granted. Um, particularly in a North American context, you know, where we spend, most of us spend 10 to 15 percent of our annual income on food, and in many parts of the world, it's well over 50%. In some countries and parts of Africa, people spend 70 to 80% of their annual income on food. Um, so, you know, there it is more appreciated. Um, we do still go through the routines of, of the prayers that thank for daily bread. Do we really think about it? Um, I think it's, it's usually people who have experienced food deprivation who really understand that, which I have not. Is, uh, has anyone taken on the project of describing the a way the, uh, the people in this area butchered a hog on uh, in the winter time, in the fall and winter, as a family project, and all the byproducts that were generated by that uh, kind of operation? Is, is anybody historically write, are writing down that history? Sorry, which, which operation? Uh, the, which, which operation are you referring to? In the where, you, where the families got together in the fall of the year or in the winter time and took a day off to butcher a hog. Oh, okay, and yeah. My, there Think, were... Yeah. There was lard, there was cracklings, uh -huh. there were something that some people called piggy butter, uh -huh. and all kinds of head cheese and so on. I know. I, um, I, thanks for raising that. Uh, I'm thinking there should be a study on that because I find it really interesting. I read a lot of Mennonite um, biographies, autobiographies, memoirs. I mean, Mennonites really produce a lot of write, historical writing, uh, particularly memoirs, community histories. And while there might be little bits, uh, short sections on different topics, when you get to pig butchering, it's suddenly three to five pages of about the pig butchering and it has to go from right the very beginning to the end. Um, in, in lots of detail, and I'm just starting to notice that how important that was. I've been to one pig butchering in my life in, in, in Saskatchewan. I was dating a fellow from Saskatchewan in college, and I went um, to visit his family, and our date was a pig butchering. <laughs> and um, I thought, how interesting is this? <laughs> it's not the man I married then. Um, but the man I married, actually, is, is uh, he, he grew up, uh, um, he's second generation Canadian, his, his parents came from Ukraine, um, and for him, they, even, they lived in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, and they came to Canada, and even though they very quickly became quite prosperous um, in, as farmers and land developers, they, they, they still considered themselves kind of rural peasants for a long time, and uh, continued those kind of practices. And, and now he, um, his professional work is as a, a, a community builder across uh, Canada and North America. And he always tells a pig butchering story um, as a pivotal moment for him as a child of refugees um, who had all kinds of struggles and dysfunctionality, but the pig butchering is when he knew he was part of a community. And, uh, I mean, he gets teary when he talks about this. Um, but I, so I, I, I think it's, an, it's a, you know, really interesting uh, phenomena about sharing um, food processes and building community that uh, I think we have different ways of doing that now. 
because we don't do a lot. Of, I mean, maybe you do a lot of pig butchering in this community. I. Hi, Marlene. Thanks um, so much for your lecture. I am. Um, it brought to mind just two, a couple of stories from uh, my background. Um, in High, at Heightsville Mennonite Church, we have a very interesting blend of Mennonites from Kansas, a lot of Bethel College graduates, and then we have a lot of folks who are from Pennsylvania and Virginia. And a number of years ago, I suggested that we have a traditional Mennonite foods potluck so that we could learn about each other's foods. And I was expecting a lot of Swebok and Varenica and Plumimos, and, and those th foods were definitely on the table, but there were also a lot of jello salads with cream cheese and um, green bean casserole with the onions on top. And I was just astounded, and I asked some of the uh, older women who had brought these foods, they said, That's, those are the traditional Mennonite foods from, from our tradition. And I had to just kind of say, okay, um, great, thank you. And um, but it was a real eye-opener for me, and I've uh, done some work among Amish in um, St. Mary's County, and I've been at some of their potlucks, and there's a lot of processed food on those tables. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't use, they may sell all those fresh eggs and chickens uh, to the tourists and the people coming by on the, on the road, but at their own potlucks, it's, 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 uh, they're working pretty fast, those women, and pretty hard, and I think that they're using a lot of the processed foods mm -hmm. in order to feed their own families. So I've, I found that really fascinating. Um, the other story is about my daughter. Um, I live uh, within a mile of my, my mother and father and my two sisters, and so we're all in the same little community, and there are nine grandkids. And when my daughter, Bianca, decided she was going to start baking, it was so exciting because the tradition is you know, going to be carried on to the next generation. My mother gathered all these recipes from her grandmothers, and so my daughter's cookbook now has, like, all, all these recipes from Swiss Volhynia and Russian Mennonite uh, backgrounds, and, in addition to the recipes that she's collected. But it was such an excite, exciting thing for the family that, um, you know, we had a grandchild who was going to uh, carry on the tradition of being a, a, a good Mennonite baker. I was fascinated by that because we live in a very urban area, and yet this was so important uh, for members of the family. Mm -hmm. So. And we sometimes think, you know, our, our children or young adults aren't so interested in this stuff, and there's certainly some things that they aren't interested in. Uh, I think food offers a really wonderful, I don't want to call it a teaching moment, but a, a way to learn about the past and also uh, exchange stories with their counterparts and, and friends so that... Um, in some of my classes, which are focused on immigration history and ethnicity and foodways in Canada, um, it's so so much fun when these 18, 19 year olds from many uh, faith and cultural traditions. I mean, I have Muslims and Sikhs and Jews in my classes, and uh, they don't know. You know, they're they're raised in a processed food, uh, partly. Um, lifestyle and it's so exciting when they go down the journey to discover their family history when I tell them to go find out what the food traditions are from your cultural background even if you have like multiple cultural backgrounds choose one of them and find out which leads to a whole learning experience about uh, about their own past and then the exchange that occurs so you know that the, the Svebach eating um, 19-year-old, you know, exchanges foods with a spring roll eating uh, South Asian student. And uh, I mean, food is a wonderful way to encounter people that you, you can't, you don't want to ask the uncomfortable questions about, you know, why are you wearing that head covering or, um, and so on. But food exchanges are an important entree for um, encounter, positive encounters. Now I can eat this Svebok, John? Mm -hmm. Let's thank Marlene again for uh, speaking to us this afternoon. And <laughs> remember that tomorrow at 11 in Crable Auditorium and tomorrow evening at 7 and then Tuesday evening at 7 are additional opportunities to 
engage with this set of stories. So thank you. Thank you.